This episode, I'm joined by John Troyer to discuss his book, Technologies of the Human Corpse, alongside discussions on death and dying. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. If you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, John Troyer, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you. No, it's my great pleasure to, to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We really are going to be talking about your book, Technologies of the Human Corpse, which was published by the MIT Press in 2020. Uh, and this is a book about, as people would imagine, the human corpse, death. Um, what I think the, the, the primary underlying discussion is about the peculiarity of what happens when you click your fingers and all of a sudden a body is not this living person with all this vibrance and rights. And then all of a sudden you're either just, it's just a body now. And what happens in relation to that technologically, somewhat philosophically, and also socially, why we suddenly have this huge change where we're sort of lumped with uh, what might be for many people a different type of sort of object. Um, but it's a fascinating read. Uh, there's a great history of this sort of these discussions going on and yeah i i thoroughly enjoyed it but before we get going um just tell us a little bit about yourself what it is you do and how you come to uh, how you came to write this book because as i understand it you are the director for the center of death so i am talking to like you know head honcho of death in the world right right so i i need to so i should correct so thank you thank you for that summation i i agree i think the book is the book is about a lot of different things it goes in lots of different directions but i think that's a fair assessment about like what happens when we go from a, like a without being too um uh, abstract about it a living state to a dead state because mm -hmm. then there's a whole series of, of things that happen um in that regard so uh as as it regards uh, how I got into this, what I do. So I, I should first off by saying I'm I'm now the former director of the Center for Death and Society. My although apologies. I was I was no, that's all right. Don't worry about it. I, but I'm now the death death studies scholar at large. Uh, and you can you can all you can also refer to me as the Overlord of Death, which is the um, the name my my sister had uh, given me met, uh, some years ago. But um, uh, but as as director for a number of years, and then um, sort of as death studies scholar at large. Um, the, the work I got into was was predates my time with the Center for Death and Society. So I want to make clear it's death and society, not just Center for Death for fear that we're, we're losing out on the societal aspect. Mm. Um, but I so I grew up in the funeral industry, which a lot of people know about me. My dad was a funeral director for about 35 years in the States. Um, so I grew up in I, I grew up around death and dying. And then when I was in graduate school at the University of Minnesota uh, in Minneapolis, doing my PhD in the um, program of comparative studies in discourse and society, <laughs> uh, which is an interdisciplinary studies degree, um, similar to the history of consciousness program, if anyone knows his con at University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, I was l looking around for a project and I came across um, some early um, early presentations of dead bodies as sort of spectacles, but also then sort of looking into death photography in the 19th century, then got interested in embalming because I knew a bit about the history of embalming anyway. And then that's kind of when everything opened up. Mm. And so that was when I became interested in this sort of this merger or this looking at the relationship between technology and death and dying, uh, in part because we were right at this moment. This would have been in the early 2000s, right when there was this sudden um, interest in uh, sort of emerging digital technologies. And that actually tends to be the default today still. Like if you ask, what, how do we use technology? Even my own students or audiences I talk to will tend to talk, think about like their phone right away. Mm -hmm. And I was always interested in, in initially analog technologies going back to the 1980s and even before, but, you know, things like VCR taping, like, you know, camcorder recording of, 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 um, funerals and, you know, things like that, slideshows, uh, you know, uh, cassette tapes, all these old technologies that we know exist, but we probably don't even have the the machines to operate them, <laughs> even if we want to do it. And that's actually become the case with VCRs. Increasingly, everyone's got like, you know, boxes of VHS tapes and no machine to play it on. Um, and increasingly, I guess that's become the case with DVDs and CDs as well. Mm. Anyway, the point is, I became interested in it, but not in, and I want to be clear about this because I think some of your listeners might be interested in this too, not in 
making sure I wasn't veering into any kind of technological determinism, which mm. is the same technology is doing this or it's doing that. Mm. That I think is actually a really, that's a huge pitfall for a lot of people who work around death and dying, but also just technology in general. Mm. The technology is doing this, the technology is doing that. And that's not the case. I mean, I think that, you know, these are tools we are using and I think we need to be aware of how these tools emerge and where they come from and what happens. And so that was, that was how I got into it. And then, um, just by chance, as I was finishing my PhD, the Center for Death and Society opened at the University of Bath, which remains, it's coming up on 20 years now, 2025 will be its 20th anniversary. And it remains really one of the world's only, um, really only death studies centers that has continued to, to work. Uh, and uh, through a series of different machinations and uh, conversations and job things, I ended up uh, working there. And it's, it's been great. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree with you with regards to technology. I think what, what a lot of people talk about when they talk about technology is the relationship, how we use it, how the tool has sort of changed us. Right. You know, if you, you know, you, we don't have to use the car, like cars the way we use cars. We don't have to no. use computers the way we use no. computers. There's a sort of a high potential that computers become very addictive as we've seen, but we don't have to use them that way. So, yeah. No. No. So it's no, very, I agree. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get to this because it's this an extremely interesting discussion. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to go from there, and especially this sort of personal personal background because that really is, uh, you know, found underlying in the book. But before we jump in with death, uh, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. You can place three three thinkers living in a room, living or dead. Uh, who do you pick? Uh, so I, I thought about this one because I was like, who would I really want to talk to? So I, there are three people I'd really want to talk to. Would be um, the uh, Norbert Wiener, sometimes you'll hear Wiener, but Norbert Wiener, who wrote the book Cybernetics, Control and Communication in the um, Animal or in the Human and the Machine, or Animal and the Machine, pardon me. Mm -hmm. And Norbert Wiener's at MIT, um, also published by MIT Press. So when I was approached by MIT Press, I was like, I'll be in the same catalog. I can't believe it. Um, but uh, Norbert Wiener was an early, um, I won't go too far as Bagri, but he's a fascinating guy who actually did some amazing things that I think I should, people should pay more attention to. But he writes cybernetics, coins the term cybernetics, is a mathematician, but on paper is working out what we what he was referring to as the ultra rapid computing machine, which remains, I think, still one of the best unused band names ever, which I encourage my students to think about. But he's saying we could create these things called ultra rapid computing machines that could use ones and zeros, so what we think was binary code, and we could do all these things with it. And he comes out of the war effort, World War II. He actually worked on, uh, he was interested in working on prediction uh, in terms of radar and predicting where to shoot down uh, German um, planes, by and large, in the future. So he's, he's a forefather, too, or forerunner of predictive technology that we use every day now in terms of, you know, search engines and, and whatever it might be. All the, anyway... So he, um, the reason I'm interested in Norbert Wiener's, I teach his work, is because when he writes the book Cybernetics, and it's worth picking up to read just the introduction, mm -hmm. publishes it in 48. He he publishes it and he he says it's in the backdrop of World War II. So he frames everything he's done in the backdrop of, of World War II and what that has meant. And so what he says at the end is, I have created, contributed to this new field. Again, remember, this is all on paper. Mm -hmm. So he does things like go to the trade unions in the States and say, uh, you, you have got to change what you're doing because what I'm working on is going to change how your workers work and it's going to take jobs away. And they sort of thank him for his time and send him on his <laughs> way. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, then he, and then he's deeply concerned about how this technology will be abused by different actors, particularly in nation states, because he said – I've contributed to this technology. It is in the backdrop of Bergen-Belsen and Hiroshima. Mm. And I can only hope it's not abused, but I have very little hope. <laughs> and that is the – and so he's he's deeply concerned about and he becomes increasingly concerned about how uh, this technology, computing technology has contributed to, has, has and will contribute to um, – sort of bad purposes and bad uses and and so he's he had he's trying to encode a kind of ethics into all of this back in like the late 40s when mm -hmm. it's all before before these machines even exist really um i could go on and on about norbert wiener because i think he's a he's a super fascinating guy and mm -hmm. just like really complex so then i like norbert wiener 
I would then like to, someone who's living, um, he dies in 64, I think it is, 64. So he's he's long dead. But I'd also then like um, Donna Haraway at UC Santa Cruz, who's I think been for a long time the great thinker around uh, technology and his, history of science and technology, but also feminist studies and the implications for the women's movement around technology. And I think that um, she she's mo- she's most famously known for infamous in some cases for the um, what's referred to in the shorthand as the cyborg manifesto, which she writes in the early eighties, where she's looking at this idea of like what how could what possibly might technology have a relationship with with a women's movement, which I won't go too far into like the sort of the the debates that causes and, and everything, but it's it's an interesting read and it's it's I, I've always wanted I've always she talks about Norbert Wiener. Mm-hmm. in some interviews where people ask, you know, are you familiar with his work? And she's like, you know, I wasn't when I wrote the Cyborg Manifesto, but I am really interested in in, in Norbert Wiener and then the other thinkers. And so I, I'd be really curious what the two of them would have to say about computing technology. But then also, too, I, I, I was thinking about this. Who would be like a, like a 19th century person who'd be really interested to do this? I would be really fascinated if, if from my book I could get Carl Lewis Barnes, who figures as this like – Bar- the P.T. Barnum of the funeral embalming because he creates this he creates a figure called the Bisga Man who is a display model for embalming, where he embalms him and he's been dead for months and he just takes him around on tour to show how amazing <laughs> his embalming fluid is and I thought you know wouldn't it be amazing if you get Nova Wiener, Donna Haraway and Carl Lewis Barnes with the Bisga Man all together just to talk about how they understand uh, societal change around new tools and technologies. That to me would, I mean, I have no idea how that even communicate about anything, but it, that would be super fascinating to think about that way. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, uh, it's one of those, it's one of those strange things where sometimes with these rooms, people put people that are hundreds and hundreds of years apart and you think, wow, the context, would they even be able to talk right. because of the frame right. of reference? So we see that here already that one of the things your, your book is focusing on with Barnes with quite literally, as you said, like, you know, strolling around this embalmed yeah. dead body. <laughs> yeah. Someone in, someone like Wiener or Haraway in the 60s, even though, you know, especially with Haraway with this sort of uh, cyborg manifesto and pushing yeah. through into the post-human futures, yeah. it'd still be like, wait, 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 you, you just roll the dead guy around for months on end you know so it'd be this weird we're already in that in that gap you see this sort of discussions going on in your book of how do we make these leaps where all of a sudden at a certain point that was um acceptable but this is the myth we'll get into you know open open casket funerals were much more common and then it moves forwards but certainly this idea so there's there's a strange thread there though right of yeah. I would say of control, maybe right. The sure. emba- the embalming is control. Vina, yeah. uh, you know, feedback feedback loops, things like this. Right. It's been a while Kinda since I've. Yeah. yeah. So that's you, right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see that? Do you see that as a possible threat? Possible. Discussion? Well, I, yeah, I do. I mean, absolutely. I mean, because I was reading Norbert Wiener for the first time when I was working on my PhD research, and I was really struck by the fact that you know he's talking about how how communication systems. Um, and systems themselves and feedback loops and how you control information and, you know, basically how you can understand human physiology in terms of it being a a communication system, because that was one of his questions. Like, you know, he, he, he raises an, an interesting question, which is, could you, is it possible to create a prosthetic device that you could wire into the, the human nervous system? Because that's actually one of his great hopes. He said, I see this technology enabling individuals who've lost ability to regain ability mm-hmm. through through merging with the human nervous system mm-hmm. again this is all speculative like he's just saying i think we could do this i think we could you know mm-hmm. and he's he sort of he sort of like foresees cochlear implants you know mm-hmm. for you know and things like that he's like i think we could do this um so uh, you know to me i think that that from the 19th century into what Norbert Wiener is doing what he always got me thinking about was you know how are how are these he's talking about early digital technologies and what would become digital technologies so he's very much in an analog world how do these analog 19th century technologies also function as methods of communication they are communication devices because of course one of the things that the telegraph line was used for right away was to communicate about when people had died or that dead bodies were being shipped or that, you know, expect this arrival of a dead body in a train. And so it wasn't if we, it wasn't as if we hadn't used communication tech that existed in the 19th century, almost immediately to talk about, you know, whatever kind of death and dying it it might be. And that, that there was this element of a kind of like, 
you know, where do we separate the human and then the spirit? And then you can get into sort of like, I would describe like 19th century mediumism and the whole idea of the mediums and like trying to use these, you know, like these new kind of like methods of communication with the dead. And so, you know, you find these resonances, I, I think, with with so much of how do how do the dead exist in digital worlds today with 19th century mediums trying to talk to the dead and you know and the thing is like for a lot of people i think to a lot of us today we're like well we we all know that was complete nonsense back then and maybe it was maybe it wasn't but to the people who heard it they believed it mm. and so maybe what we're doing today digitally is also a lot of nonsense or will be in the future but you know to a lot of people today you know, they believe it or it's, you know, it's there. So, or, I mean, they're different. They're not like for like, but I think that there are relationships there that mm. I think are important. Mm. I'm sure this, this, these figures, I know Barnes will definitely come back in, but I think this, this is, I wasn't expecting Wiener at all. So that's an interesting figure. to put, <laughs> put he's, in he ha- he's had a huge impact on my, the way I think about so many things just because, because I, I, because I work, yes, in death and dying, but also when I was working my PhD, it was very much science and technology studies mm-hmm. uh, and history of science and technology, but also bioethics. And I think that for a long time, I've, you know, I've, I've worked in bioethics around death and dying, but there are all kinds of ethical questions around the use of technology, but also around technology at the end of life and end of life care. And, you know, do not, I think it's always important to remember that something like a do not resuscitate order is itself a kind of technology in a, in a term of way of thinking about how we choose to not have technology used, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that is, I mean, living wills, all those, sort of, that whole development across the 1970s. And so, um, you know, to me, Norbert Wiener really, he, I mean, he, when I, when I read his, you know, I read his um, work for the first time, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, this is, like he really saw what was coming <laughs> in a way that I think is needs to be re-examined, <laughs> you know, at all times. Mm. So, I feel I feel cybernetics never really got the landing it should have should have got it got forgotten. Well, it got absorbed into yeah, and it got absorbed into other work. To be clear, I mean, I think that you know, obviously, because if whenever cybernetics gets picked up, obviously, then people want to move into this idea of like the cyborg or the cybernetic organism, which is you know those two things put together. But that I think cybernetics just became, in many ways, computer science. There'll be computer scientists, I'm sure, who would be, you know, shouting at the screen right now or however their ear pods saying, no, no, no. But I think that is Norbert Wiener is working in computer science before that's a field. And so what he's calling it is cybernetics because what he wants is that kind of control and communication. And then it just merges into a whole long list of other fields. But I think the history of it, yeah, absolutely. I think it's always important to look at, mm-hmm. particularly the ethical concerns he raises. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So to draw in something you, you mentioned at the start and to draw in this biographical element of your book, you so you were um you were in the death industry from, from day one. I was, yeah. Born into it. Yep. How how has that affected your uh, how you approach death? I guess you never you don't really know because you that's how you've always yeah no it's a it's a good question because i have thought about so i it's just always been around me like i've never not been around death um i have just always it's just always been you know part of the way i sort of view the world um i think that it was only when i became older so it was probably when i was in my teen years that i kind of realized like i had i had just grown up differently than other people not a bad way but i just like i was like other people didn't have these kinds of experiences. We never lived at the funeral home um, we, or above the funeral home. We, we always lived in different houses. So I never lived in the funeral home, but I spent an enormous amount of my youth in funeral homes. Really actually kind of bored, just waiting for dad to get done at work. Like it was just so, a lot of it was just so normalized and kind of mundane that I think I was just like, ah, can we go yet? So I think that <clears throat> for me, it was just a very normal experience. And how it's affected me. I mean, it's, it's made how I negotiate. I think death and dying on a personal level has made it different than how other people might. I'm not, and I, I have to be careful here because I'm not sure I'm not, I'm not protected from it, but I think mm. it has made how I think about some of it different. Um, oh, like a full, like a full in, internalization, like an acceptance. Well, that or also too, like, I just understand how things work in a way differently than other people do, um, which can be useful. You know, it doesn't, again, it doesn't make it any, you know, less painful, but it can make it, you know, different. Mm, mm. That's strange. So the sort of focus of knowing all the nitty gritty details of the technology system, they're about to be, sort of be thrown into the corporate. Yeah, or what I can, into. yeah, or what I can ask for, or what I don't want, or how things work and don't work. Yeah, all of that. I think, and it, I mean, it, 
you know, it, it, that's true of a lot of things. If like the more, you know, mm. you know, the easier it can be to kind of make decisions about what you want or don't want. And I think that's part of what I'm getting into. Mm. Okay. So the, the huge question for me, because I, your, your book, I will admit, burst a huge bubble of mine, which has been, which I've sort of purported in various podcasts that I've done, which I firmly believed, which is the myth of the death taboo that in the modern world, we, we don't talk about death. We don't want anything to do with it. We're like, no, 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 don't mention that. Push it away. Right. So this, this whole idea that the modern world is sort of, uh, yeah, keep trying to keep death away until like eventually it right. just comes and they have to deal with it because everyone does. This is the death, this for you and for Toff, Lynn Toff. L- uh, Lynn Laughlin. Lynn Laughlin. Yeah, 1970s. It's called, yeah. is, is called, you know, the death taboo and it's a complete myth. So. Right. Okay, let me let me. I would say in the modern world, but is it is it the case then that this is a myth? This is this is complete. This death boo is complete myth. But do we have a different approach than previous eras, or is just this completely yeah. unfounded? So I feel as if I've succeeded in my goal as an intellectual <laughs> and a writer. If you, I hear someone say it's completely exploded. That no, I think so. There are a couple of things going on with your question. It's a good question. So what of the death tab is? So I, I, I'll be, so everyone knows who's listening. I, in fact, everyone who reads my book, uh, Technologies of the Human Corpse, published by MIT Press, uh, mm-hmm. you will know that I, I, the foundation of that book is around the idea that there is no death taboo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have, I, in fact, I was many, I was many years into my PhD when I, I kind of heard people talking about it. I'm like, wait, no, that's not a taboo. Like, I grew up around it. Like, I can tell you it's done it. So, so there are different ways to look at this. One is there's a difference between saying something is a taboo and something makes people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And that I think is, but that's an important distinction mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because, you know, I've, I've given talks in audiences, right, where I'm like, okay, so let's talk about the death taboo. What would you rather talk about? Um, let's say music you'd be interested in having played at your funeral mm. or how much credit card debt you have. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? And like, and people are like, let's talk about the music. How's that mm. sound? Like I'd rather, you know what I mean? Or, or like what, how much debt you like. The, and so there are things we don't like to talk about, but that doesn't make them, I think a taboo. What happened was, and this is, I'm here, I'm really parroting Lynn Laughlin's, um, thinking, in her 1978 book, The Craft of Dying, uh, which I still think is one of the best books ever written about death and dying ever. Uh, MIT Press did reissue that in uh, 2019, sort of a, 20, a 40th anniversary edition. And it, um, uh, you know, she, uh, um, she died, unfortunately, uh, this last September. So Lynn Laughlin just died, but it was, but it was, I was really proud to be able to get her book reissued. And she knew that it had been reissued. So let me get through. So Lynn Laughlin um, does The Craft of Dying. And, and she, what she posits in The Craft of Dying um, in a chapter, chapter three called The Happy, pardon me, The Happy Death Movement, is what she says is, um, there is what has emerged in the 1970s is a whole way of thinking that death is now a social movement, which is true across in the, in the 1970s. It's I think it's part and parcel of a lot of 1970s um, broader, in many ways, geopolitics. So I, I would always be the first to say I think it's actually in part a response to um, – the death around the Vietnam War. Um, I'm an I'm an army of one in saying that I think that Ernest Becker, when he writes The Denial of Death, which comes out in 73, wins the Pulitzer Prize in 74. I actually think he writes The Denial of Death um, as a response to uh, the war in Vietnam. I think you can read that book as a response to the war in Vietnam and the part of the States. No one else agrees with me on this, but I think that I think it is possible, entirely possible to read it that way. Um, and that I think there's also then going on at the same time across the 70s. I think the uh, the second wave feminist women's movement is a huge part to play here because you find um, a push towards more equality, but also the redress of you know inequality and access to healthcare for things around um, you know like breast cancer, other kinds of cancers affecting women, not only women but women in particular. 
but the push for more you know quality of access around any number of political things and then also then you know the early environmental movement is mm-hmm. taking off then and so existential questions around you know what is going to happen to the planet which we're still around all these things are around today um work into that then questions around I think civil rights and different issues around, you, you know, like even at that time, police violence and whatever that might be. I think these are all part of this broader kind of social movement that's looking at death and die. So Lynn Laughlin says you have something that death is becoming a social movement. And what she'll say is you have the happy death movement, um, which I think is important to point out that she points out in the 1970s is largely kind of white and middle class and relatively affluent, <laughs> sort of like hippies. She'll say, what she'll say is, counterculture and straight culture together straight meaning kind of like you know not like a not counterculture not Mm. it has nothing to do with sort of heteronormativity or anything like that and um which i think is largely still true today (laughs) just my way of saying i think that still we still kind of have that same kind of dynamic today the point is what she'll say is you have these kind of happy warriors this happy death movement which she doesn't use as a pejorative in any way she's saying i'm not this is not a kind of me making fun of them these individuals i'm saying they're the happy warriors trying to get people to talk about death and she goes through rehearses all these things they do but what she'll say is any social movement has to have an enemy it has to have the invocation of an enemy Mm -hmm. and if it doesn't then it won't really work as a social movement because it has to be something it is working against and so what lynn laughlin will say is the happy death movement then picks up and works with the death taboo as that thing it must stand against Mm -hmm. And it becomes a very useful mm. foil. Whether or not it's true mm. doesn't really matter. It actually be, just becomes part of what you'll talk about, sort of like death movement intellectuals, <laughs> which I'm like, well, I'll put my hand up on that one, I guess. Like this idea that it becomes the utility as such mm. that it is important. And that's why. And so I've always argued that I think, and the kind of like neo Freudian pick up on this idea of like, you know, taboos and whatever, how you want to think about that, but that this whole language around a death taboo picks up, not because it's something people don't hear about or talk about or could look at every single day. It's because it needs to exist as this thing people want to fight against because in order to try and talk about death more, or however you want to think about it. Now, the truth of the matter is you don't need the taboo to get people to talk about death, you know, more all you want. Um, but it has, it has been very useful in that way, which is why it's always ironic where people are like, we all know death is a taboo. So now let's talk about it a lot. And I think that's the, mm-hmm. you know, that's the, that to me has always been this sort of, now does it make people, again, does death make people uncomfortable? Can it? Yes, it can. But so can conversations about rats or spiders. And I'll do this with my, my undergrads. I'll be like, you know, we could come up with a long list of things you really wouldn't want to talk about, mm. you know, I'm sure. Or things that if I said, you know, sort of describing like, you know, rats crawling across your body or you know, spiders, like a lot of people, I could stop. I can't. I have like a, a severe, you know, fear of that kind of thing. So, yeah, other people have that, sure. But I, I just don't think by and large it's, a, it's the taboo it's been made out to be in that way, in that way. Why do you think it was just middle class people? Do you think their lives were so comfortable they thought, right, we're going to have to draw in some discomfort. We've got to shake things up. Yeah, if well, there's working, a whole lot. If you're, yeah. if you're working class, you don't really want to think, look, I'm, I'm grinding all day here, 12-hour days. I also don't want to think about the fact that I'm, <laughs> I'm going to die. Yeah, well, it's not – I, you know, I would say it's it's not even so much – I think there's a couple things going on. I think there there's – there's been a whole, there's been a real middle class, a relatively affluent, let's say, but also middle class push around these topics because those are the groups that have the time and the money to think about it, mm. honestly. And mm. and also, ha- ha- we've seen a greater gap grow in death rates among the affluent and the lesser well off. And that is persisted. In fact, that's only grown. And so, you know, sort of the lower, the lower you go down into a socioeconomic sort of like, you know, levels, the the more common experience death is. And so it, you know, I think it's, it's, okay. Because I had a student ask me this question one time, which I thought was a good question. And it was just like, well, you know, middle class affluent people die too, right? I'm like, yes, of course they die too. But what I'm saying is, it's important to keep in mind that, and I say this is someone who's come from, you know, American middle class, you know, background, um, who already thought about death a lot, but nonetheless, I understand this idea that, you know, you can, there are ways that you can, you can put off thinking about death because it's just not part of your everyday 
lived existence in the way that for a lot of people who are poor, it is mm -hmm. because people are dying in a, you know, it's a much more everyday kind of experience or different kinds of social situations. Um, and I think that that's, that's why I always find the valorization, the valorization or the valorization of, um, or the holding up, let's just say the holding up of, um, the Victorians. So funny because it, uh, there are a lot of people I know who, um, you know, talk about the Victorians, they really got death right. And, and this is not to, you know, make fun of that. I get it. And there really was a whole aesthetic around death and dying certainly in the Victorian period, uh, that is, you know, to be studied and is studied. Victorian death studies is a whole thing, literature and music and theater and art and, and the whole idea of like what clothes you wore and what you didn't wear and mourning rituals, and uh, which is endlessly fascinating. But one of the reasons it was so possible for the Victorians to do all that is because everybody died. I mean, you know, the mortality rates were mm -hmm. such that death was much, I mean, you know, infant and child mortality mm -hmm was off the charts in a way we i don't think we want to go back to honestly <laughs> i mean we could and there was this moment i think early on in covid where i think a lot of us who work on sort of pandemic preparedness and planning were like well are we maybe we're going back there you know what i mean as far as that goes um that was very real on in, in the idea of like what happens what happens when you have this new vector in in like inject itself literally into a kind of like human pool and then what happens but i think that's the one way to think about it too that it was I, so i think you have to be careful when you talk about everybody needs to talk about death more because it's more often than not coming from people who have a sort of well-off background where it's possible for them to not talk about it do you think and, sorry and i think that's important i was just saying, i think it's important mm -hmm. to like do you think that that's one of the reasons that uh death photography was was uh far more popular is you know if you have if you're going to have seven to ten children and you know i don't know three or four of them are going to die before the right. one you know it's it's right. it's a bit more understandable to have some amount of you know remembrance of a photograph or something like this and that idea of you know it's, it's not such a rare event it's pretty much a common a very common right. occurrence where in every family it would have been known that people would have lost children or lost right. people for so right. so in that sense it's not as strange to have that that photograph or that remembrance. No. no, I don't think so. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that death photographers did right away when they, one of the things early photographers did in the 19th century, mid, let's say mid 19th century onwards, it was they advertised that they would do death photography and they did that right away. And I, I talk about that. It's sort of at length in chapter one of the book, because it's, I think it's really important to understand that, that photographing the dead was understood as a really important kind of, market to get into a service to offer and that what they would say is you know we can be to the your house in under an hour mm. to capture the most lifelike appearance possible and so that's where a whole world evolves emerges around the photography of dead children oftentimes posed with the parent or parents because it would have been the only image that they would have had of um you know, of their child. Mm. And so I think that that is, you know, I get that. I understand that. Can we still do that? Is that still legal? Sure. Oh yeah. People, oh, of course people photograph the deceased all the time. I mean, in fact, I would, I would go so far as I argue. I think we photograph the dead even more now, partly because we've got digital cameras on our phones. Like it's never been easier. The difference. And I think this is a difference. It, one of the key differences is those images are not put on display mm. uh, in the way they would have been. So you would have had a display of, of you know, like postmortem photography in the 19th century. That would have been something that might have been a display in, I don't know, the sitting room or something like that where people could see. Um, I think that has changed. It's sort of like social custom has changed. The idea of photographing the dead, I don't think has changed at all. Um, and sometimes this will kick up every, every once in a while. There'll be a photograph of a deceased person put on some kind of social media or something like that. And then there'll be, well, is this appropriate? Is it? And then, and then all of us who work in the history of this get rolled out to talk about like the history of how like, images of the dead have played out. But I, so I think it, it still happens. It's just not, um, I think the most recent, the most recent dead body that's been, this is not in a personal level, but certainly there were um, a lot of images that circulated of, uh, of, um, well, former Pope Benedict, after he died, um, there were images of him laying sort of out in state. Um, I don't know if that's in state for the Vatican or whatever it is at the Vatican. And so there were images of that. So I think that that was certainly, that's an example where we still see a dead body like that. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to take a second here to talk about the Partially Examined Life podcast. If you're looking for an excellent philosophy podcast, here is the show for you. The Partially Examined Life is a philosophical podcast by four guys who are at one point set on doing philosophy for a living. For each episode, they pick a text and chat about it with some balance between insight and flippancy. You don't have to know any philosophy or even have read the text they're discussing about to follow and enjoy. With a 13-year-plus catalogue of episodes, the Partially Examined Life has probably covered any philosophical topic you're interested in, from practical ethics to the theoretical foundations of science. They go deep into the history of philosophy while making it personal and funny. Join the over 45 million downloads already pondering the Partially Examined Life. Find new episodes wherever you stream your podcasts or at partiallyexaminedlife.com. Peculiar question, but I mean, it's interesting because this is sort of been your life's work and it's two-parter has your definition of what death is and of what a corpse is changed i mean what are what is death and what is a corpse well yeah that's a great question so what is death i mean i i still so to me i still tend to um i ask i ask it's one of the questions i always ask my undergraduates my final year undergraduates in uh, my sociology of death class first day of class what is death and then i have them they do short weekly writings for that class. And then I, I have them answer that question on the first day uh, for the first weekly writing. And then for the very last weekly writing, 10 weeks later, I have them answer what is death to see how they think about it in the context of uh, how that has changed. And oftentimes they'll say, I've, it's really changed. So I think about it because I would have thought it was like this, that, or, um, so to me, you know, death, what is death at a very basic clinical definition, I do tend to, I tend to side with the, let's say the neurological brain criteria for death, uh, as opposed to <clears throat> cardio cardiovascular heart criteria for death. Uh, other, there is still a big, you know, there are still individuals and groups that will prefer, um, heart criteria to brain criteria, um, for lots of different reasons. So there's, there's a clinical biological setting. I personally, I, I tend to, one of the th- one of the ideas I've really come to appreciate and and think of reflect on a lot since I've started my work is um, this idea that and it comes from um, uh, Silverman and Claw uh, or no Claus and um, uh, Dennis Claus and um, yeah, Silverman. I think. I'm blanking on names. Oh, apologies, colleagues. Uh, but this idea of continuing bonds, so that after after. A person dies um and that was actually this was postulated as a way to get around this idea of stages of grief from elizabeth kubler ross which actually weren't stages of grief it was stages of dying that that was initially used for but then it got changed after she publishes on death and dying into stages of grief which more by and large by and large are just not are not discussed in any way in any kind of formal therapeutic counseling setting anymore. However, it persists in a kind of pop cultural death understanding that there are these stages. And so you hear this all the time, but in order to get around that, what Silverman and Kloss wanted to say was, no, it's not about stages. It's about this continuing bond that no matter how long it's been and for good or for bad or for everything in between, you continue to have a bond with the deceased. And it is that bond that is something that continues to define the relationship even after the person is dead. And so I think that for me, death has become, because it's become much more personal for me over the last, you know, four and a half, five years. I think that it, I, I, I have a strong degree of understanding of this idea of continuing bonds now in a way that I, I didn't have before, I will be honest about. So that's changed. As far as dead bodies go, that's an interesting question too. I mean, I, you know, a dead body has always to me been a dead body. That hasn't really changed radically since I was a little child when I first encountered dead bodies in, you know, in the funeral home. But that's to me because dead bodies were just totally normal. They've never been abnormal in any way. Um, you know, I think, so, you know, so, I think one way maybe is that, you know, to see, to see a dead body is one thing to see a dead family member is a different thing. And maybe mm-hmm. that is, so I, sometimes I have to think, how do I negotiate the fact that I know this family member is dead and it is, the, it is a dead version of them, but, but, you know, that's, but I still understand they're dead. And so I, I you know, I see, but I see, I, one thing I will say is I do see dead bodies, particularly after the war, I see them as being much more dynamic than I think we give dead bodies credit for. Like, I think that one of the arguments I always want to make in my book is that, you know, after a person dies, they, their body may actually, 
see more things happen than it did leading up to when they died. Like it could be there's there's a whole there's a whole series of things that happen after an individual dies that so they may not be participating, quote unquote. And here we get into whole arguments about do dead bodies have agency? <laughs> I'm endlessly fascinating, but that you know the circulation of the dead body is such that it can be circulated and moved and handled and have all kinds of things done to it that are actually pretty dynamic and active like it's not you know it's not a static kind of situation but also too you know i, I think that I, I i have a lot of respect i have a lot of respect for death i have a lot of respect for dead bodies and i think the one thing i've come away from the most in a lot of my research is just to always always keep that respect for death mm-hmm. and keep that respect for dead bodies like the, i think the second you show disrespect to death in particular or disrespect to you know dead bodies like it's you know things don't end well mm-hmm. as far as that goes because i think it, it these things need to be respected and do you think that's what's happening in in that in that transition from person death to corpse is what happens to agency? Well, yeah. I mean, I, there's a whole argument around do dead bodies have agency. I, I, I've never really gotten into that argument because I was like, well, I, you know, it's not – it's kind of besides the question. Like, Because a, a lot of it has to do is that when you die, you're no longer a person, right? Mm. So, you're no longer – so, when you die, you're no longer a person. You are human, but you're no longer a person before the law. And that's because personhood is itself a kind of – you know, it's a it's – a, it's a convenient legal fiction, as it were. Like, when do we think about personhood? Which is why corporations can be persons, um, and other depending on where we're in the states now. I was going to say, which is also then one of the reasons that um, uh, fetuses are not persons mm. because that th- that ties into reproductive rights and reproductive law as well. But um, the, I think the thing to keep in mind is that you know when you die, you're no longer a person, and the reason you're no longer a person is because the law needs to negotiate how to try and deal with the legal questions that are involved. And so, because you can't represent yourself, someone has to do it for you. And so, I mean, that's, that's not different necessarily than say a person who's in a comatose state, but if you're in a comatose, comatose state, you're still alive. And so you still have that degree of personhood. Like that's not it. Anyway, the point is this thing gets into the whole questions of agency. I've always said, well, I guess corpses do have a degree of agency, which is this, they decompose, right? And that's an active process. So if you want an active process, some kind of agency, what's corpse agency? It's decomposition, right? That's biology at its finest. <laughs> so nice. But it's peculiar because we, had, we must adhere to something which makes us understand that maybe, you know, to very loosely use the word like sacred, you know, it's not, it's not an object in the sense that we could like a coffee cup, if it broke, we'd be like, oh, whatever, it's a coffee cup. There's still this right. sort of bond, like bond to use what we were talking about before, where we go, we, we still can't be callous with this. There's still these like vague rights around this right. thing, even though it is now an inanimate object, basically. Right. It's just right. Inanimate Subject matter. object. I mean, it's, it's so, yeah, there's, there's a blurring of the lines there, but yes, absolutely. Mm, so, this is, you know, this is the peculiar, one of the peculiar topics that your book takes up is like, as soon as this thing has happened, all of a sudden, there is now almost new possibilities for this dead person with regards to what right. rights they have and what, what, what technologies can now be used. And I mean, how, how has that relationship, how has that relationship changed over time? About like which technologies can be used? Yeah, which or? technologies can be used. I mean, and, and sort of the rights of the, the rights of the corpse. Have we become more precious? <laughs> um, it's a good question. So, I mean, there have been some obvious changes, which, for example, different religious groups will adopt methods of disposition. So, for example, the Catholic Church saying that cremation was okay. Yeah. was acceptable and that was i think that was i want to say that was 63 maybe it was in the 60s um other groups too you find a growing you find a growing community you find growing community support for individuals who may who may identify as culturally jewish but maybe not practicing mm-hmm. uh within the faith but even to even individuals who may be more um liberal practices of of judaism sort of like reform judaism other groups who actually are also interested in cremation as opposed to burial. And that is, that's always been one of the big, um, you know, burial is considered one of the, this is the main form, if not the only form of final disposition for, for um, 
Jewish and Muslim you know communities. So that's so that's as that's those are just two examples. Whereas as theology changes, then other methods can change. Can what be done too? You could say the same thing around organ donation, in which as attitudes about public attitudes around being a donor and what that means in a secular sense, but also in a religious sense. Um, with the exception of Jehovah Witnesses, all the major and minor religious organizations have said it is fine. In fact, it is your obligation as a as a practi- practitioner of this faith to be an organ donor, uh, and that that is something that should be done. So I think that you know, organ donation is is a good example. Although that that itself, I think, is in some ways it's interesting to track that because that has itself become um, has really transformed into not just being you know, an altruistic kind of gift. It's now giving the gift of life, right? Mm-hmm. This idea where, which on the one hand is true. Like, if, you know, and if you're a person waiting for an organ to be donated, or you're on the, any of the registers around the world and you need this to happen, like it's a very serious thing. Uh, and I, I'm an organ donor. I'm for, signed up for organs, bones, and tissues. Everything can be taken if I die. Even your eyes? Even my I'm eyes. Not, see, that's the common do, one, right? Do you, well, do you I've know heard, about the eyes? Well, yeah, I've heard this, uh, that people will be like everything... But not the yeah, eyes. But the right? eyes. Yeah. And in fact, I was just talking about this this week with a, a different interview, but I talk about it with my students too. Like it is true. And so so it, there's this common, common hang up that I wasn't even aware of because I uh, have agreed to have my eyes taken out. The reason you remove eyes, in case anyone's curious, is you need to, you can use the corneas for cornea transplants. So it's not as if your eyes are being put into someone else's body a la, a la Tom Cruise and Minority Report or something like that. But it is, it's the corneas and what's called eye nucleation is done to sort of remove the eye to get to the cornea and things like that. Anyway, the point is eyes are the one thing that in survey after survey, particularly it seems like over in England, over here in England, particularly in different parts of the UK, a lot of people will say, I don't want to donate my eyes. And I ask, I actually ask my students about that. And I've learned that if I ever really want to see a class kind of just go off the rails, I'll just start talking about eye donation. And like <laughs> a chunk of the class is just like, stop, stop, it's making me. In. And I asked, I'm like, why? Like, why do you get, and some of those students who don't care, like, yeah, why? Like, why does this bother you? And one student a few years ago, I think just, and very honestly said, the eyes are how you see the soul. You know what I mean? And so I think that there's, whether you're a secular individual and in belief or not, I think there is an element that the eyes are the window to the soul, as we like to say, mm. and so that, that that becomes that thing. Or I just something about I need my eyes for whatever reason, even though I'm dead. Um, and so that I think that is a legacy of something that is still around, you know, even very old, ancient-ish kind of thinking around about the body, even though I think in our own kind of, I don't like post-Cartesian way of thinking about the world. We get that that's not necessarily, well, it's not true. A lot of people have different, different levels of faith and belief, but I think that is one example of things where maybe things haven't changed or, or are changing in, in a way that is different too. Mm-hmm. How do you see the death industry changing? Do you have any like predictions of things we might begin to do? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, it has changed a lot. I mean, one of the big changes over the last 20 years has been there's just there's just far more women now in in the funeral industry and the death industry in general. In fact, the, the majority of graduates from mortuary science programs and training programs, the majority, and this has been a majority for a long time, are women. It's just been, and that's been a massive change. In fact, you are more likely to, to work with a female funeral director than not across most Western countries now. And in fact, um, and for a long time, there was a gap between like owners and managers, still mm-hmm. relatively male, but that's actually shifting to more women now too. And it's becoming multi generational. So you have you have a lot of female funeral directors who are themselves, um, you know, second, third, fourth generation funeral directors, and so they're you know they're taking over the family business, uh, you know, in that way too. So I think now th- does that does that? So then there's a follow on question, which is so does having more women make it a better industry, not by default. And in fact, if you talk to a lot of female funeral directors, they'll be like, you know, I don't know if it's a better industry because I'm a woman, but I do know sometimes that families may appreciate speaking to a woman more than a man. And it's, I mean, it's, you find all different kinds of attitudes about this. I'm not trying to essentialize gender for anyone who's like screaming at the screen about like it, your podcast about this too. But I think that has been a change. And in fact, my father was for many years an early advocate 
for more women to get into the funeral industry because he was just saying like it's just it's just way too if this industry wants to survive it has to more more better reflect the the society at large like it cannot it is not sustainable if it's only men going into the industry it just it won't it won't thrive because it's just not possible for it to, to do that um and so I think that, you know, the industry itself has changed. It's also changed how it, it thinks about different methods of disposition, you know, different kinds of disposal methods. I mean, those are always, you know, every, every few years an idea comes out or it's done or different things like that. I mean, I think that there's, there's been a lot of different people who are interested in different aspects of the funeral industry, whether it is celebrancy or if it is, you know, um, different methods of memorialization, whatever it might be. And I think that, all that stuff is is to be expected, and I think it is by and large fine. Like, there's no reason not to have all these things that change. Um, what I do think is there there will always be a need in some capacity for someone, in some whatever capacity it might be, to be there to handle the debt. There is a lot you can do yourself, and there's been a whole push around DIY home the home funeral movement. And I get that. And I support that as well. But I think too, like at a certain point, there are people you'll need to work with at a certain, you know, at some level, you don't have to, you can go to alone all you want, but that there can be, there's, there's an element of, I think, um, comfort and helpfulness that can come mm. from that. So, you know, specific question. I've never, I never didn't, I haven't thought about this until now. Of course, you have burial and then cremation, and then right. I would assume maybe medical science donation would be the next most popular. Right. Is anything else on the rise? Because I'm I'm stumped here for any other options. That yeah, no, like no, there are, yeah, they're different. I mean, there's different methods. So it would be um, so you, cremation and burial remain. Although burial is is well, it depends where. You, so burial remains the most common for different religious communities, um, uh, really in Judaism and Islam, different parts of Christianity and also too where there's land, but you know, you, but cremation rates are growing exponentially. And so, for, you know, for example, in the, in the UK, the cremation rate has been like, know, like 73, 75% annually for, so it's, it's definitely become like the common mm -hmm. form of final disposition. There are other forms are water-based systems that have lots of different names, but more or less are an alkaline hydrolysis process. That's been around for I don't know, like since the early two thousands. Um, and that there, you know, there's different there's different groups offering different versions or methods of a water disposal system that uses alkaline hydrolysis. So it's a, it's basically you have a base like a strong base that then mixes with the hot water and the dead body and it, the acid in the body and neutralizes it. And you know, you get bone fragments that are pulverized similar to a cremation. Yeah. So they're water based systems. Um, then th there's there's been a, a resurgence of interest in um, aerobic decomposition uh, in terms of what's referred to now as like human composting. And so that's become the one that everyone with um, that's the one that's been interesting to watch because there are a lot of different companies that are trying to get into this market in terms of investment possibilities. So there's, there's a whole kind of, um, is that, I mean, is that how I'm visualizing it? Just sort of dump a corpse on a field? No, you don't dump it. No, it's, I mean, it's a whole process. People can find it. Let me be clear. The companies that do this offer very specific, you know, things, but, but basically you're kept in a container and mixed with, with different kinds of, um, uh, aerobic decompo. Like you're, you're mixed, it, you're mixed with, uh, materials to try and support and activate and help, uh, induce aerobic decomposition through heat and warmth and other kinds of, because, because we, we, you know, we decom once, once we're dead, we begin decomposing. And, and that is itself, you know, because it, unless we're sealed in something that is left, that will be an aerobic decomposition process because it's, you know, it's supposed to air. And so there, but there are ways to try and accelerate that. Um, and so there are different companies that are offering, you know, programs where what you do is you then are mixed in with different, um, you know, natural products to try and accelerate it and then reduced. And then once you're reduced, uh, the family is given the, um, uh, the remains usually in a kind of peat type soil or their product. And then they can take that with them and they can do whatever they want to with it. Um, but that, and but that's a much longer process too. Mm. Um, which is okay. Then you have the world of, then you have the world. I was talking earlier in the week about cryogenic preservation of individuals who want to be cryo preserved for the future, mm. um, either their head or their whole body, one of the two. Uh, and that's, that's a much, that's a minority kind of approach because of course we don't, 
no one knows if it's going to work. Yeah, as I, as, I <laughs> as I understand it, we can freeze, but we we it's a big bet because we can't unfreeze. Yeah, yeah. The cryopreservation. Oh, all the transhumanists are going to come after me now about this. Yeah, the cryopreservation. Well, who are interested in cryopreservation? Th- those are two communities that don't always get along. I want to be clear about this. Okay. But that cryopreservation as a as a method of cryogenically. Um, preserving the deceased you have to be dead before you're cryopreserved because if you're not dead before you're cryopreserved that's murder mm. so you, you have to be dead <laughs> you have to be dead <laughs> then you're cryopreserved and cryogenically you know kept but the idea but it's it's all it's all about a bet in the future mm. it's then interesting in- that there's a similarity there between the death photography and the cryogenic because when i looked oh, yeah. i looked at some of their sites recently and yeah. one of the big selling points is we'll be at your house you know oh yeah they have to they have to be there that quick yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's part of the agreement. <laughs> they have to do it fast in order to get what they would describe as the is the best preservation of cellular um, mm. composition. Uh, which, because of course, once we die and once we lose oxygen internally, cellular cellular breakdown um, really begins quite quickly. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so there's cryogenic preservation. I'm trying to think of the other ones. There's a whole other world that's working on sort of, and this is related to the transhumanist, posthumanist sort of strand a little, somewhat, and in some cases, sometimes related to the cryogenic strand, but not always. But then there's a whole world that's working on um, like digital um, preservation, sort of like Neuralink, kind of like it, Elon Musk has made suggestions he's interested in trying. Well, it's to, a great know, question though, of what's, consciousness without a body right. like we don't know what that <laughs> well, yeah, is no or, or or even if it's possible to upload you know i mean like i mean there's you know i i've watched neuroscientists just like throw their hands in the air and be like no no it's not like you can't you can't just do this i'm sure i'm sure you've interviewed neuroscientists who are like no 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 no. like you can't you like we we've gotten to the point where we actually can have links to communicate with computers through brain processes which is great but we're nowhere near being able, trying to like transfer an entire consciousness or whatever. I mean, that's just that's is it possible? Maybe, but that's way beyond that kind of. But then also too, like, is that desirable? <laughs> like, it's, you know, if you're, I mean, that would be the other thing too. So then you've got that, and then you have, then you have. This is I'm getting further and further into the sort of the um, mm-hmm. away from the the strands. And then you have the other group that is very much sort of like not totally but very much sort of silicon valley uh usually dudes but not always i don't ever want to preclude women from being involved in any of this but that this idea that we can uh we can cure we can stop aging and we can get rid of death so that's that's the whole we want to cure all disease which is fine so even if but if even if you cure heart disease diabetes cancer dementia all the big ones great that's amazing and i would totally die. support that <laughs> but you still are aging yeah. and so so there has to be a cure for aging which is one of the great riddles i think for cryogenics which is so say you cure all disease that killed everyone all the diseases that killed everyone that are you have cryogenically preserved mm. great i support that i support getting rid of all the big ones have you figured out how to stop aging mm. because if you can't stop aging what's the point in a sense of curing a disease if you're still going to age mm. and still die from <laughs> die from that depending on how old you are so i mean those are that's so there's a whole group of people trying to like not not only slow down aging which we've done like we live much longer now there's no question Do you think that, that impulse is out of primarily out of a fear of death or more of a desire for more life uh i well i think different people have different reasons i think my joke about this has always been it's the only way all the silicon tech Valley dudes will live long enough to spend all their money uh, if they live for like forever. But I think, so I think there's, I don't know if it's less about a, a fear of death. That's probably true for some people. I think it's also just trying to assert control. Mm-hmm. You know, I want control of this. I want control of that. Uh, I also think it is um, part of, uh, you know, some human hubris, like we, uh, you know, we can control these dynamics and I just, am not, I, when it comes to death, I'm not convinced. I think death finds a way, right? Mm-hmm. Death always finds a way to, you know, go all the way back to like Jeff Goldblum and Jurassic Park. <laughs> like life finds a way. But I think, you know, I think death finds a way. Mm-hmm. I just do. Are you scared of death? No, no, no. no. I mean, I, you know, I, I have no interest in dying like soon. <laughs> I would like to live. 
a long life, healthy right. life. Um, but I'm not particularly, no, I'm not particularly scared of it. I, so if the question is, am I, am I willing to die? Yes. Am I ready to die? Yes. But I'm not, you don't want to. I, I don't really want to <laughs> no. this very second. Do you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't be. Mm. But yeah, I, mm. I feel like everything is kind of in order. And every I've gotten all, you know, my fare is in order. There's some things I need to update now. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it. Mm. I guess getting near the end here, one one question sort of with a lot of these discussions, I try, you know, where where should where should the reader begin with someone's work or what would be some practical advice? So maybe I'll ask you, what do you think the average person could do? Or what, what do you wish the average person would begin to do to sort of start thinking about death and their corpse in a in a different way, which is perhaps more helpful, more positive, more more open. And then I guess also yeah. maybe what is one thing you wish people knew about about this discussion that we've been having? Well, so I so before you get to your own dead self, what I would say is I you need it's important that everyone sit down and have you know, lengthy conversations that can go on for a long period of time, um, but with next of kin, especially if you're going to be the person who's responsible for making those decisions. Um, if you want a helpful starter, uh, the end of my book, um, sort of the coda of my book has a series of questions you can go through. You don't have to use those, but I'm saying it's there if you want to. MIT Press would like me to remind everyone about that. <laughs> but I, the reason I'm saying this is this: it is personal in this regard. So I, I, I was already an advocate for this, and it, in many ways, an evangelist. But I've become even more so because so my sister died in 2018, July 29th, 2018, of brain cancer, and I had I had kind of worked with her and what some things she wanted. I'm actually the one I, I write about this in in the preface of my book, but I'm I'm the one who told her she was dying because she was dying of brain cancer, and she was in hospice care in Italy, and the hospice. Um, was excellent hospice care, but they just weren't talking about dying, which made no sense to me because it's hospice care. Mm. But that just wasn't part of that that um, that tradition of hospice care. And so I had to tell. And then she died two weeks later. And so there were things we needed to try and think about and do. And and we did that. And then as <clears throat> sort of as a result of that, but then two of other dynamics in in late 2019. Um, I, so in, in late 2019, my dad had a, um, cardiac arrest at Minneapolis, St. Paul international airport. Uh, he'd come back from a cruise with my mom and it actually turns out that having a cardiac arrest in an airport, it's not a bad place to do it. Cause there are a lot of people waiting to respond to like, you know, do things. And so he was resuscitated, um, mm. and then went through recovery and actually, it was a long story around the recovery, but he, he recovered more or less, although, and we still don't really, we didn't really know why. Um, but that then put in, kicked into gear me talking with my mom because we didn't know if my dad was going to make it. And then eventually my dad getting everything organized in their, um, online accounts, getting everything organized in terms of their estate, getting everything organized because my sister had died. Julie was no longer with us. So I would become the person responsible for doing all these things, getting a trust set up, all of it. So that it was very clear what my parents wanted and didn't want and and who was going to be doing what when they died. And that and that also, too, I had access to all these things. Mm. I knew where everything was. I helped them organize it. And I knew exactly what to do when when they died. And that the reason I'm saying this is because in last May, uh, May 28th, my mom died. Uh, May 20th, 2022, died of um, from colon cancer. Or bowel cancer. And so my dad, and she had hospice care at home. And so my dad and I did that. And then in November, my dad died. November 21st, 2022, my dad died. So I, I you know, in the course of I, well, five years almost, but certainly in the course of the last year, say over six months, but two years, you know, found myself now um, sort of the sole surviving family member. And it's very difficult. It's, it's difficult to talk about this. I don't want anyone mm -hmm. to be like, well, you're just kind of rallying. It's not. It's difficult to talk about it. But I feel, I feel it's important to talk about because one of the things that made this all so much it's not better in any stretch of the imagination but more manageable mm. is that i knew what to do mm. and i had everything organized and i i knew <clears throat> i didn't have to struggle with trying to find things that I knew I would need or had to take care of after my parents died. And that only compounds the grieving. 
So, so before you get to yourself, although it is important when you're having these conversations, speak to then your next of kin or the people who would look after you, make sure they know what you want too. But I think that, you know, it's, it's important to, to, and remember too, your, your ideas can change. Like none of this is set in stone. You can, you can, your what you want to do can change and should change very likely. But I think it's, you, the most important thing is just have those conversations and make it clear. Um, because if you, what you don't want is a situation, and I know this happens because I've seen it happen. Um, someone dies, and you have no idea what to do, mm. no, no idea where anything is, if nothing. And I think that's so. That's important to, to try and do as as well. Um, so that's that's my little pitch for make sure you talk about those things. As far as what you want to do for yourself, just make it clear. Think about it. You know, my my most important thing to me again is that I'm a, I'm a, I'm signed up to be a bone tissue and organ donor including my eyes. So uh, that to me is the most important thing. What happens after that is fine. My parents are both cremated. My sister was cremated. My parents are cremated. I'm fine with being cremated. I have no problem with that. Um, we actually had very simple, my, well, my mom and dad particularly had very simple funerals. My dad didn't want um, anything. You know, we actually had what we, they both had what would be regarded as direct cremations and then a service later. Hmm. And he was fine with that. He didn't want um, anything to, you know, complicated mm -hmm. which i think that the funeral directors we were working with who knew my dad was a funeral director were like huh really ron he's like no nah, i still want it so <laughs> you know it's fine mm -hmm. you had a second question too and i can't remember what Just <laughs> maybe one thing you wish people uh, knew maybe about the about death oh yeah yeah i think i think the main thing to know about death is that it's entirely possible to talk about we should talk about. You can talk about it every day. You should talk about it and think about it every day. There's nothing morbid about it. Um, there's you know a huge distinction between between thinking about death and thinking about your own death and thinking about self harm. And I think those things get mm -hmm. conflated. I think it's very important that we encourage our young people to talk about death and dying, particularly teenagers, and that it's completely normal for teenagers to talk about death and dying. And I worry that we're we're making them we're pathologizing conversations that young people want to have about death and dying for fear that it somehow or other is them expressing, again, ideas around self-harm or suicide or whatever that might be. And that is very serious, but it's different than saying, I'm thinking about death and dying. Actually, right? there's a, there's a, question, a question I had there. I'm, hopefully, you're, are you okay for time? Yeah, I'm yeah. fine. Yeah, go ahead. Because you mentioned about young people, and uh, it seems you're focusing on teenagers. But when I actually worked, I worked in a, a, a first, and, first and secondary school in the UK some time ago. So, it would have been ages uh, like four, four to seven. And I right. found that children more often not are uh, really often making references to death and things like dying not in yeah. any morbid sense but a, a, in a very innocent and like they, they 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 just know that that's how it happens and there wasn't any like morbidity or somberness no. about it and do you think no. you, you mentioned the like the pathologizing of it do you think this sort of the, the once again it goes back towards that myth and the tab, the idea of the taboo but do you think it is somewhat taught like oh no 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 don't talk about that or it has to be so it's sort of like going to the i don't know the dentist right it's a big fearful thing but it's like well you taught them that it's a big fearful thing right it's, right yeah no no i th and i think that, that i think that children learn to be afraid of it <sighs> um that and that, that my dad said that for years. He's like, you know, children don't get emotional about death per se. They get emotional when they see adults getting emotional. Mm. Uh, and so that I, I think there is a strong learned behavior around that. And and but that's okay. Like it's not, you know, sometimes we have to grow into you know feelings of loss or you know whatever those might be in grieving. Uh, and I think that is. Um, that's fine. Uh, I I think that, it, but it's it's important to encourage encourage young people to talk about teenagers, younger kids than my own students, you know, who are in their early twenties. You know, a lot of them will say in the sociology of death class, you know, I, I, one of the things I really appreciate is just how, how I can talk about this and it's not weird. I'm like, no, it's not weird. Like it's fine. And in fact, I had <laughs> a really, um, a really great student this last year. And she said, you know, I have spent years in counseling with this just absolute terror about death and dying and like you know fears for lots of different and she she said to me i feel like i have gotten more done with myself and how i think in this class mm. than all those years of death and dying <laughs> I, I get emotional about this. Oh, sorry that's no, good it says it says a lot about uh 
says a lot about your class. This is a lot about the fact of, you know, yeah. And she, the, just, the, the str- she just wanted me to know that she's like, she said, um, it's, I still, it will be difficult to talk about, mm. but I'm not, I'm not afraid of death anymore. And that to me was, that to, I, I, I get emotional about, I, I, I knew I shouldn't have talked about these students because the, when my parent, my parents died, when my, well, my dad died in November when I was teaching that class, the students were so unbelievably supportive and I, and this is a student in that class. And so like it, uh, mm. to, to, um, to talk about the students just automatically makes me get emotional. But yeah, she, she just wanted me to know that she said, you know, I want you to know that it, I, I it will still be difficult to talk about, but I just, I'm not. I'm not afraid of death anymore. And that to me, I think is, is not through any brilliant, amazing teaching I may have done, whatever. It's just you, if you give people an everyday environment mm. in which they can talk about death, mm. then I think that's what they respond to or can, mm. you know, if they trust the person and if they just know it's okay, it's okay to talk about it. And so, you know, I, I think that's the thing I would encourage everyone to try and do. And then also just always be respectful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, be respectful of death and dying. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me, I think is really important too. Mm. So are you uh, continuing your journey into death more? Are you writing more on death? What are you working on? Um, yeah, I am actually. I just emailed my editor today. <laughs> it might be press like, yeah, well, no, he and I have been talking about, well, I'm always, you know, I'm always working on a book. Everyone's always working on a book. But the, you know, the the uh, the thing I'm, I'm really interested to work in now is on the children of funeral directors, uh, because we are we are a unique um, mm. a unique tribe, as it were. Although I don't like that term, but we're a unique group. Um, and but then globally, like around the world, because I there, when is I, there meetups. No, 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 <laughs> there's not. But we all like. But if you get us together, like we all have had really kind of from around the world, like very similar kind of experiences in some ways. And so, but also too, I think a lot of us who grew up around it, you know, we just have a different perception of life and death and what that means. Um, and, you know, a lot of us don't go into funeral, the funeral world. Some of us do, some of us work in different ways. We find it, we find it pulls us back in, you know? Um, but I think that I, I am really interested in, in the children of funeral directors. And so that's, that's become this new project to, to talk with, um, to talk with us to, you know, amongst ourselves to see, you know, kind of, cause my sister and I always thought we joked about that. We would always joke about how, you know, we, we knew we'd grown up differently <laughs> and how the way we had grown up just gave us like a, like a different view on the world. And, uh, and that that was that was something we both were deeply grateful for. Mm. I think as we got older. So that's going to be a book. Yes, it would be a book. Yes, assuming it is, it needs to be formally uh, proposed and go through the whole process. Mm. But yes, that would be a book. It'd be a book book like manuscript because I I'm what I'm interested in doing is going around the world uh, to talk with or well or doing Zoom calls around the world <laughs> to talk with uh, you know individuals who are the children of funeral directors, maybe grandchildren, but a family connection nonetheless to, um, to then see uh, their memories and, and things and how they perceive, you know, different parts of, of death and dying. Um, and that is cause you know, yeah. So that's, that's what I'm interested in working on right now. Sounds fascinating. So and also partly, partly autobiographical, partly for me too autobiographical. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, uh, just to, I guess at the end here to plug your book, Technologies of the Human Corpse. You know, some of the I'm well, the best sections in this are really these extremely personable sections, the autobiographical sections. Not not to say the rest isn't very no, good understand. or anything like that, but it, it, it's uh, in a sense it's sort of une- unexpected from from the blurb, and so it was a uh, sort of a beautiful entry into into the book. Um, and this will be able to be found. Technologies of the Human Corpse by John Troyer. On the MIT Press website, and your own site is just John Troyer. Yeah, JohnTroyer dot com. Yeah, and then and you can find the book in all the all the usual places where you can find books. And I I, I want to give actually I want to give credit very quickly if I can mm-hmm. to my editor Matt Brown Matthew Brown at, at MIT Press because he I, originally the book didn't have any kind of autobiographical material at all, and he was the one who really encouraged me to do it. And in fact, he was like he was like John, you know, like you you, you know your backstory is like super interesting and in like one of the reasons i think this book is really really great and i was like yeah but 
I'm not like I'm not I don't write memoir material. Like I don't think of myself that which is fine. It's just not it's not a genre I would think about getting into. And so I was really on the fence about it. And then and then my sister died. And I was like, all right, I want to write about this. And and Matt and everyone at MIT Press said, yes, do that. And that so the text becomes a so the book becomes a hybrid. I agree. It's it's a it, in some ways it's even I think some readers have found it a bit discordant because it just sort of it it it, it is weirdly I think it worked, but that I can't explain that. And I think it, it's it worked in a way that it was just like hybrid text of different styles and and you know approaches to writing and different in my voice, but even in some ways different voices and whatever however you want to think about it. Um, but you know, the thing, the thing I always think about is did it, but it's a better book because of it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. I think it's a better book Mm -hmm. because of it, which you just got me. And thank you for that. But did it take, did it take my sister's death to make it a better book? And I think about that a lot because part of me would say, yes, it did. My sister's death and writing about that made it a better book. But also part of me thinks I wish I, that I never had to write about it. Right. That I never had to write about her death. So if she, if we accept that she died and she did and is dead, and I, I am understanding of what that means, then I would want her death. And now going forward, the deaths of my parents I would want her death to be able to mean something Mm -hmm. and how I'm able to talk about death and dying. So in that way, I was, I was, um, it was an honor to be able to write about my sister, you know, for the book itself, um, knowing she would never see it and she never did. So I'm just glad my parents did. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that's a a beautiful place to finish up. I'll be sure to put all the links for the (laughs) book and your own work in the description below. Thank you. John Troyer, it's been a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Great. Thank you for talking.